Thanks so much, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Madeline Potter to our group. She'll be presenting on the topic of biological control of the brown marmorated stink bug. By way of introduction, Madeline is a master's entomology student at the University of Maryland. She joined Dr. Paula Shrewsbury's entomology research lab in 2018 and has since been conducting research to identify ways to sustainably control stink bug pests, such as the invasive brown marmorated stink bug. Part of Madeline's master's thesis includes a community science project that utilized over 50 master gardeners from five different Maryland counties, including our very own Mo Montgomery County. Previously, Madeline earned a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Horticulture, a minor in Sustainability, and a High Honours Certificate in Entomology from the University of Maryland in 2019. Today, she'll talk to us about stink bug pests, biological control, and her community science project, and the ways that we, as Master Gardeners, can support the effort to su sustainably control pests within our green spaces. When I spoke to Maddie last week, she shared with me that her interest in presenting this topic was inspired by her own research and the community science experience that she had and shared with many of you. I hope you'll learn some new information from Maddie and can apply the techniques that she shares in your own garden this summer and beyond. Um, Maddie's slides will be available on the website later today, so look out for that. And without further ado, I want to introduce Maddie. Thanks so much. Thank you, Renu, for the warm welcome. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for my slides. Can we see everything okay? Yep. We're good. Looks great. Awesome. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. I'm excited to talk to you all about biological control of the brown marmorated stink bug. So a little bit of what I'll talk about today is I'll first introduce what stink bugs are, specifically what the invasive brown marmorate stink bug is. I'll get into ways we can sustainably control stink bug pests, such as biological control. So I'll introduce that subject, um, which will lead me into my community science project, which I utilize to answer some questions on ways we can better utilize biological control against pests like the invasive brown marmorate stink bug. I'll lead into what you can do as master gardeners in your landscapes to help support sustainable pest control. And then I will leave some time at the end of the presentation for questions. So feel free to type your questions in the chat throughout the talk. I just won't address them till the end, or you can feel free to write your questions down on a piece of paper. Okay, so what are stink bugs? Stink bugs are insects in the order Hemiptera and the family Pentatomidae. So if we look over here to our right on the slide, we have a lovely drawing or a diagram of an adult stink bug. And stink bugs have a shield-shaped body. So you see outlined in blue here, the shield shape, which includes part of their thorax and all of their abdomen. So sometimes another common name for stink bugs are shield bugs. Stink bugs produce an odor when they're threatened. We've probably smelled this ourselves when we've tried to pick up a stink bug. Um, some people describe it as a cilantro type smell. I know after years with working with colonies of stink bugs that every time I smell cilantro, now I associate it with stink bugs. Um, not super great when I'm eating food sometimes. <laughs> and stink bugs possess a piercing sucking mouth part, which is like a straw-like mouth part. In this mouth part, they can either be an herbivorous species, so they use this mouth part to feed on plants, or it can be a predatory species where they're using this mouth part to feed on other insects. Adult stink bugs are typically about three fourths of an inch in size, but the sizing can vary based on the species and also based on their nutrition. So here's a photo showing this piercing sucking mouth part that I was talking about. Um, we have a black arrow pointing it to it here. And we can also call this piercing sucking mouth part a proboscis or a rostrum. There are a lot of different common names um, in entomology for this type of mouth part. And if we were to pick up an adult stink bug, they typically hold this piercing sucking mouth part on the underside and the center line of their body. So if they're not actively feeding, if we flip it over, we can find that long appendage down the center of their body coming down from their face. 
And so as I mentioned, they can use this piercing sucking mouth part. Um, if they're an herbivorous species, they're gonna stab this into plant tissue and suck up the contents of plant cells. Or we can have predatory stink bug species where they're using this mouth part to stab into other insects. And we can see on our bottom right here, we have a photo of a predatory stink bug and it's feeding on some sort of beetle larva. And so generally we can label our herbivorous stink bugs as pests and our predatory ones as beneficials. You may have heard the term beneficial used to um, refer to our pollinators, but we also can refer to our predators out in our landscapes as beneficials as they're benefiting us by reducing pest populations. So one of our key herbivorous pest stink bug species in our landscapes is the brown marmorade stink bug, abbreviated as BMSB. Its scientific name is Polymorpha hals, and it is an invasive pest from Northeast Asia. It was first detected in the United States in the state of Pennsylvania in the mid 1990s, and is now spread to 46 states. It is not a picky eater. It has a very broad host range with over 200 recorded host plants that it feeds on. And it has two generations per year in the state of Maryland, one in June and one in late July. We look over here to our far right, we have some photos on our slide. On our furthest right, we have a photo of an adult BMSB stink bug. And ways that we can tell this species apart from other stink bugs we may find in Maryland is a combination of three traits that we can look for. The first one is going to be these two white bands that are going to be in either of their antenna on top of their head. The second trait, if we look toward the shoulder area of our insect, right behind the head, this is called the pronotum area of a lot of insect bodies. If we look toward those shoulders, it's going to be smooth. In some other stink bug species, the shoulder area could be toothed in texture or like saw-like on the edge. And then our third trait is alternating light and dark bands along the posterior area of our abdomen. So a combination of these three traits will point you toward um, BMSB as a species. Our top left photo here is BMSB egg. So I'm holding on to an oak leaf. I flipped that oak leaf over and I found these BMSB eggs. So each one of these little balls here is an individual egg. The mother BMSB typically lays 28 eggs, so glue them together and glue them on the bottom of the leaf. After a couple weeks, they will hatch. The eggs typically turn this translucent color, like a white color. And then we see these baby stink bugs known as nymphs, these black and orange little bugs. They'll go through several life stages where they're molting and growing bigger, and they'll eventually become this adult BMSB. So since our BMSB is herbivorous, also because it is an invasive, it aggregates in large numbers and reproduces really quickly, we label this as a key pest within the United States. And especially because of the damage that BMSB can cause. Since it has a very broad host range, it damages a lot of our fruit, vegetable, nut crops, as well as our ornamental plants. And these are some photos of the type of damage that BMSB can cause with that piercing sucking mouth part. So on our top left, we have some bruising on an apple for them from their feeding. We can see that it damages corn kernels as well, soybean pods. On our bottom left, we see some dimpling um, caused by that piercing sucking mouth part and also damage to tomatoes. So these are just a couple of examples of the type of damage that BMSB causes and it's caused a lot of economic loss to our agriculture and ornamental system. Now, before we get into ways we can control BMSB, I wanna show that there are lots of other species of stink bugs within our landscapes that can be easily mistaken for BMSB. So all of these different stink bugs, each one of these is a different species. They look fairly similar. Um, but what's important to note here is that identification of our insect before we take control against it is really important. We want to know exactly what type of pest it is and if it is a pest. Because when we look at all these stink bugs, they look fairly similar. We may think of them as all pests. Oh no, we find this on our plant. Is it going to harm my plant? But our center species here is actually a beneficial. 
It is a predatory stink bug, which can actually help control pests within our landscape. So this we can label as our good guy. So we wouldn't want to take control against this. Um, one thing if we are looking for a spine soldier bug is they have very pointy and sharp shoulders, that pronotum area of our insect. Some other herbivorous stink bugs we may see in our landscape, just want to make note of them here is the harlequin bug, um, the green stink bug, and the red shoulder stink bug. I will say that if we just find one or two of these stink bugs in our landscape, we likely do not need to take any action against them. There's a lot of native stink bugs within our systems. They're just a part of our food web and they are likely to not cause significant damage. It's just when we get them in large amounts um, that we could see damage on our plants. So with my main topic of biological control of the MSB, I wanna present a storyboard here as I go along throughout the talk. So I'm gonna to continue to add on to the storyboard um, throughout but we just introduced our first part of our story, which is our key pest of BMSB. So what is a way that we can sustainably control BMSB? We wanna reduce the amount of pesticides that we're spraying in our landscape. We wanna find a sustainable way to control this pest. And one of those ways is this method of biological control, which is the use of predators, parasitoids, and or pathogens to suppress pests populations below damaging levels. So using living organisms to help control other living organisms that we label as pests. And along our bottom, we have photos of examples of our le bottom left, we see an example of a predator, which is our ladybug or a ladybird beetle feeding on an aphid. In the center photo here, we have an example parasitoid or parasitic wasp. She's using her egg laying appendage to parasitize or pierce this caterpillar to lay eggs inside of that caterpillar, which will ultimately kill or control that caterpillar. Um, and her babies will go through several life stages and eventually emerge as adult parasitic wasps, so a type of control. And then our bottom right, we see an example of a pathogen, which is a fungus that has taken over this insect and ultimately killed this pest insect. So I've used this term as beneficial toward predators, but we can also use this term as natural enemies. So our predators, our parasitoids, and our pathogens are natural enemies. They're naturally occurring within our environments already, and they're enemies of our pest insects. I'm going to go through some examples of these natural enemies of stink bugs and the brown marmorite stink bug. And the first thing is predators of BMSB. We have lots of different photos here of different insect and arthropod predators that attack BMSB. In our top left, we have an adult wheel bug feeding on BMSB. On our bottom left, we have some baby or nymphal wheel bugs feeding on BMSB as well. We have lacewing larvae feeding on the eggs of BMSB, um, different spiders, robber flies, mantids, and even our minute pirate bug is feeding on our top right on a BMSB nymph or baby stink bug. Next, we'll get into a pathogen that has been found to control BMSB, which is called Nosema modoxy. It's a microsporidian pathogen, and microsporidia occur naturally in the environment. They found that the specific species of microsporidia um, not only attacks BMSB, but other stink bugs as well. Now, little is known about this species, so there is a lot of research that is currently underway to learn more about it. So I won't go into too much depth with this. Um, but I did experience when I was raising colonies of BMSB for my own research that one thing that we could tell um, that the stink bug was infected with this type of pathogen is if we flipped it over on the bottom of their abdomen, we can see these dark little spots. So our top left two photos here. And this is just a darkening um, of their cuticle. And then I also have a photo on our far right where we can see some of the spores of this specific pathogen underneath a microscope. Last but not least, I'm going to talk about my favorite natural enemy, which are parasitoids, and what I have focused my research on. I like to consider our parasitic wasps are unsung heroes because they are a very important source of biological control, but they tend to go unnoticed because there are a lot of parasitic wasp species that are very tiny. 
Now, if we look around us, we have something typed up. A period at the end of the sentence is usually around the size of the parasitic wasp that I've been working with. They can even be smaller than that, or we can have some larger ones. Our top right photo, we can see a parasitic wasp on top of a leaf, so that one's a little bit bigger. But we have a vast diversity of what parasitic wasps can look like. Um, it's good to know that they do not sting humans. Um, they're looking for their host to parasitize, which is why um, some of them, which are the females, have these long ovipositors, which is their egg laying appendage. Parasitic wasps can either be endoparasitoids, meaning they're parasitizing, they're laying their eggs within a host, or they can be ectoparasitoids. So they're laying their eggs on the outside of the host. There's a parasitic wasp for e almost every pest insect out there. So we think of the thousands of different pest insect species, there's a crazy amount of parasitic wasps that are out within our environment. And they're just a part of that food web helping to keep the balance. Parasitic wasps, just like our pollinators, are very sensitive to insecticides. So we wanna take care when we are thinking about different controls within our environment, that we wanna help protect these parasitic wasps along with our pollinators by reducing insecticidal spray. And similar to our pollinators as well, our parasitic wasps love nectar. The adults are omnivores, so they can feed on their hosts, but they could also feed on nectar and they use this as a great source of energy to produce eggs and to go out and find their hosts. So if we wanna attract more of our parasitic wasps, to help support biological control within our landscapes, we want to plant flowers and floral resources. Now, parasitoids of BMSB are parasitoids that are called egg parasitic wasps. So they attack the eggs of stink bugs instead of the adults. And what they do is we can see this little short video on my right here. And this is a stink bug parasitoid that's on top of a BMSB egg mass. And this is underneath a microscope, so it's zoomed in. So remember, these parasitic wasps are really small. And what this parasitic wasp is doing is using her antennae to feel out the eggs, to sense them, to see if they're going to be a good host for her egg. If she feels like they are a good host, she's going to use her ovipositor, which is toward the end of her abdomen. She's gonna stab it into this egg, lay her egg inside of the stink bug egg. Her egg will hatch this tiny little parasitic wasp larva, so worm-like insect, will feed on the contents of that stink bug egg, go through several life stages, pupate, and eventually will chew a hole onto the top of that stink bug egg and emerge out as an adult. This is a type of control against our stink bug pest. Stink bug egg parasitic wasp, can either be specialist or generalist species. And a generalist parasitic wasp can parasitize more than one group of insects. So we have our example here on our left, we have our generalist egg parasitic wasp, and we know that it can attack eggs of stink bugs, but also eggs of butterflies and eggs of mantids as well. On our right, we also have specialist parasitic wasps. Our example here, um, parasitic wasps is only attacking the eggs of stink bugs, or there can even be further specialists that only specialize on, on eggs of the brown marmorid stink bug. There are four generalist BMSB parasitoid species that we know of out in North America, and there are seven specialist BMSB parasitoid species in North America. So I wanted to focus in on these parasitic wasps um, as a great biological control agent in our landscape against BMSB and ways to support this parasitic wasp, to support their population so we can encourage more sustainable management, biological control of our pests. And something we can focus on is the reproduction and the feeding of this parasitic wasp. And since these are egg parasitoids, it's knowing about their host insect eggs, especially with our generalist parasitic wasps that have more than one group of insects that they utilize. And the two main groups of generalist BMSB parasitic wasps are Anastatus and Uncertus. And the specifics of their host breath are unknown. So we don't know exactly 
all the different types of insects that they utilize for feeding, so for nutrition and for reproduction. So there's some questions there to investigate. And through previous research, when I went through the literature, the most successful US native parasitic wasp of BMSB was a species called Anastatus reduzii. And when I'm talking about success, it means that this parasitic wasp is the most successful at finding BMSB eggs, parasitizing them, the larva developing successfully and eventually emerging out of that egg. This species is native to North America. We do know that it's a generalist, so we do know it's going after more than just stink bug eggs. It's been found to be an arboreal species, so it prefers to be in treed or wooded habitat. But most of its life history is relatively unknown, so we don't know a lot about this species' biology and ecology. I did want to point out our picture to our right. Um, is zoomed in underneath a microscope. We can see an adult female Anastatus reduzii, typically a metallic body. Um, and if we look toward the wings, we can see they're generally dark, but they have these two white bands in the wings for this species. And then our bottom photo, this is my pointer finger, and this is a male Anastatus reduzii, so we can see how small this wasp is a small but white, mighty parasitic wasp. So adding on to our storyboard, we have our key pest, BMSB. Now we have our key natural enemy, Anastatus reduzii, but with this unknown biology and ecology. So if we want to better support Anastatus reduzii, we need to know and learn more about ways we can support them through knowing more about their biology and ecology. So this is where I framed my research with this main question of what types of insect eggs does Anastatus reduzii, as well as the other different species of BMSB parasitic wasps used for reproduction and also used for nutrition as well. And I designed this broad plan here where I would go out and collect any and all insect eggs throughout Maryland, bring them back to my research lab to place inside growth chambers to figure out whatever was inside that egg, hopefully finding some of these parasitic wasps to learn more about them, and then to identify what these parasitic wasps were and what these eggs that they were coming out of. And the first thing I want to talk about is this collection process, because I knew I would need help with this. So our storyboard, bringing back our key pest, key natural enemy, we have our key questions that we want to investigate about Anastatus reduzii, such as the insect egg host range, what types of insect eggs is, are they using, overwintering insect egg host, preferred habitat, and associated host plants. And so I turned my research project into a community science project in order to utilize master gardeners, such as you all, throughout Maryland as community scientists. And this was going to help me um, be able to reach more areas of Maryland and be able to collect more data as well. And I call this community science project, Project Think Be Gone 2. Now this is labeled as two because I had a colleague that had a similar project um, and she called it Project Think Be Gone. So I was adding on to this, Project Think Be Gone 2. Um, I was able to recruit 50 Maryland Master Gardeners from five different counties, including Montgomery County. Um, there were 17 volunteers from Montgomery County. Everyone was virtually trained since this was during the pandemic. All the volunteers were provided collection materials and data sheets and everything was shipped back and forth to one another. People searched for these insect eggs throughout Maryland from March to August of 2021. And I had a lot of fun working on this project, working with the master gardeners. Um, I had a web page. I created this logo we can see on our top right for the project that was stamped on the side of the boxes that we used to ship back and forth the materials. And here's a collage of photos of all the different types of insect eggs that my community scientists were collecting. And so insect eggs are just as diverse as the insects themselves. Um, especially when we take a look under a microscope, because a lot of these insect eggs are pretty small, um, but lots of different shapes, colors, sizes, textures, and we are able to zoom in, especially on our top right here, we can see some type of moth or butterfly egg 
They almost look like gumdrops on the bottom of this leaf. And so just a really cool world to explore and to get into. And so my community scientists were not only out in their environment collecting these insect eggs, but they were also collecting and recording relevant data that was correlated to this insect egg that they would find, such as the type of host plant, um, either the common name or the scientific name that they found this insect egg on, the exact GPS coordinates of where they found this insect egg in Maryland, the type of habitat that this plant was in where they found the insect egg and then as well as the date they collected it. So lots of really cool data that we can use to learn more about these parasitic wasps. Each community scientist got this collection kit we can see in our top left, um, which included this yellow cooler, which came with an ice pack to keep the insect eggs cool until they were shipped off to me. There's data sheet, um, these Petri dishes. And so once they found an insect egg, typically it was collected with whatever plant tissue it was found on, which could be a leaf or on bark. It was placed into a Petri dish. Um, all the information on the top of that Petri dish was filled out along with filling out um, the correlating line on their data sheet. And then by the end of the week, they would place whatever they had found in the cooler, place this into the shipping box along with the data sheet. They had prepaid shipping labels to ship this off through FedEx to me at the Shrewsbury Research Lab. And what I did once I got these insect eggs is I would place them into what are called growth chambers, which is basically like a refrigerator where it can control the temperature, the humidity, and also the day light cycle. So I'd set these parameters to mimic the outdoor conditions so that I can rear out whatever was inside these eggs. And so my lovely lab te technicians and I, every other day or so, we would check all of these insect eggs for emergence of whatever insect eggs were coming out of there. And then our job was to identify um, the group or the species of what these insect eggs were, and then also to identify whatever was coming out of them. And so we have these key questions about anastatus for Duvii, why we are interested in these key questions and using this amazing data that the community scientists were collecting to answer these questions is we can use this to identify habitat, plant features, and plant species that best support natural enemies like our parasitic wasp of Anastatus rhodesii to hopefully lead to research-based recommendations to best support biological control of the brown marmorite stink bug. So being able to, after all this research, to get results, to be able to tell people like you, landscapers, and growers that there are certain habitats, plant features, and plant species that will help encourage sustainable pest control within our system. And so now we're going to get into the results of the community science project. And the first results I'll start with is collection and participation results. So out of the 50 master gardener community scientists that I had volunteer and that were virtually trained, 66% participated, and this means 66% at least searched once throughout our time or had collected at least one insect egg to send in. And this is really good for a community science project because everyone has their lives. I really appreciate any sort of interest in the project. So I wanna thank all of my master gardeners that were involved. Um, and I was really excited about this, this participation and this interest. My community scientists collected over 12,800 insect eggs, over 100 mantid ulufeca, so those are the egg sacs of mantids. Uh, over 150 different plant groups were searched for insect eggs, and nine different Maryland counties were searched as well. So more than just the five counties that my the community scientists resided in. And so here's a map of those nine counties um, that were searched. So again, demonstrating why community science can be so amazing and helpful to collect more data. Um, I would have been able to do this myself. And so I got a, a really great broad range of different areas that were searched for these, these insect eggs and searched for these parasitic wasps. And so now I'm gonna get into the results about the parasitic wasps, specifically looking at the types of habitats they were found in their associated host plants, 
and the host insect eggs that they were using for feeding and for reproduction. And we're gonna have two groups when we look at these results. So always on the left side of our screen, we're gonna see the results for pooling all of our BMSB egg parasitoids together, which includes 12 different species, and that includes our Anastatus rodivii species. And then on our right, we're gonna narrow in just on that key parasitic wasp of Anastatus rodivii. So first we'll look at the habitats they were found in. On our left, again, we have all of our BMSB parasitoids pooled together, and we have eight different habitat types that they were found in. And then on our right, Anastatus rodivii was found in four different habitat types. And we're gonna look at the top three habitats at the same time for both of these groups. And the top habitat type for all of our BMSB wasps and for Anastatus rodivii was park with woods. Our second top habitat type was private yards. So this is a residential yard such as yours. And then the last thing I wanna focus on is the top one for all of our parasitic wasps together was vegetable garden. But if we look to our right, Anastas rodigae was never found in a vegetable garden. And this makes sense since previous research has shown that Anastas rodigae is arboreal, pre prefers trees, and there typically aren't a lot of trees in our vegetable garden. Now moving on to our plant species. So, since our data was collecting insect eggs, these are the plant species with eggs that were parasitized by all of our uh, parasitic wasps pooled together on our left, and ones that were parasitized by Anastatus rodigii on our right. So we can call these associated um, host plants. And we can see a long list of different plants. So we can see that a lot of parasitic wasps can be found um, within our vegetable garden. And then over on our right, our top three for our arboreal anesthetist rodidii is red maple, eastern redbud, and black cherry. Now we're going to end with our host insect species. So these are the eggs of certain insect species that are utilized for feeding and reproduction. On our left, our top three is harlequin bug, wheel bug, and brown stink bug, which is a native stink bug different from our brown marmorid stink bug. And then for Anastatus rodivii, the top three hosts were wheel bug, that native brown stink bug, and the eastern leaf footed bug. So, some conclusions from these results. Wooded habitat supported the most BMSB egg parasitoid populations especially anesthetic rodigae. So trees within our landscapes and our parks are gonna help support this parasitic wasp. BMSB parasitoids may be commonly associated with maple due to the increased presence of insect egg host, honeydew, which is produced by our piercing sucking pest insects, or spring floral nectaries. So we know that our parasitic wasps need this nectar in order to have enough energy um, to go through their life cycle. And so future research is needed to explore this a bit more. Acer, Circus, and Prunus, um, genera of trees, could be planted in areas to attract and support in a status for DBI. And then some more results that are coming soon that I'm still currently working on is producing models to indicate the best predictors of parasitism. And some traits that could be a best predictor could be the presence of floral resources, the presence of extra floral nectaries, um, the bloom time of a specific host plant, et cetera. I was able from this um, data to identify four new insect egg host species of Anastatus rodivii, so learning more about that host range. I was also able to identify the overwintering insect egg host species of Anastatus rodivii, so learning more about um, the ecology of this wasp. And then what was really cool is I was able to find energy Skilled interactions. So there's interactions between two different species when it comes to Anastatus rodivii and other generalist natural enemies such as predators. So they're interacting and they tend to clash within our landscape sometimes. So that's something to further before we say want to encourage lots of um, more populations of Anastatus rodivii as they may be clashing with our other natural enemies in our landscape. So something cool to look into. 
So what can you do as environmental stewards, as master gardeners within our green system to help support sustainable pest management, such as biological control, and to help support our natural enemies like our parasitic wasps? The first thing is to reduce pesticide use and to choose your pesticides wisely. Reducing mosquito sprays is a lot of our mosquito sprays, such as Mosquito Joe, can be pyrethroid based, which studies have shown can harm natural enemies, such as our parasitic wasps and even our pollinators. Planting a variety of floral resources with a variety of bloom times. So having flowers within our landscapes that bloom in the spring, having some other flowers that may bloom in the summer and some that bloom in the fall. So we have lots of different floral resources for our different insects. Also planting a variety of plants that have different heights and three-dimensional areas such as ground cover, shrubs, and trees. Um, identifying an insect before considering it a pet. So if we think back to our example of all of our different brown looking stink bugs. We may see them in, within our landscape and automatically assume as a pest, but there was that one that is actually a predator. It's one of our good bugs out in our landscape. And so leading into my next bullet point of learn how to identify key natural enemies. And if you need help with this, you are more than welcome to send me photos of insects if you have any questions about that. We also have this awesome resource you may have heard of called Ask Extension through University of Maryland. I've helped with this before, where you can send in any of your questions. And I've helped with especially insect identification, people sending in photos of an insect on a plant, and if they're wondering if they need to take control against it. And last but not least, choosing pest control methods carefully, so as to not harm our beneficial, our good insects out in our landscape. And if there's one key thing that I want you to take away from today's talk, it is this. Sustainable pest management is about reducing pest populations, not eliminating pest populations. Because in order to support our natural enemies and to support biological control, we need to be able to provide our good bugs shelter, nectar, pollen, and number four, alternate prey. So our good bugs need food to eat. Got rid of all of our pest insects within a certain area within our landscape, then we're also going to get rid of our good bugs as well. And then we're going to have a spike in those pest ones because whoo -hoo, they don't have any things that are eating them. So in order to have a balance within our system, we are going to need some of our herbivorous pests because they're a part of that food web as well. And these two lovely photos um, from Dr. Paula Shrewsbury are a great example of how we can add some structural complexity and plant species diversity within our own yards and within our own landscape. So on our left, we have a photo of a typical yard. We don't see a ton of plant diversity here, not a ton of structural complexity, which may, just means um, amount of vegetation found in a particular three-dimensional space. But if we look to our right photo, we have a lot of structural complexity. We have some floral resources down here on the bottom left. We have some different types of shrubs and bushes. We have different types of trees. We have different plant species. And studies have shown that when we have this diversity of um, structure and plant species itself, it's going to create different microhabitats, um, refuges, sources of food and habitat, nectar and pollen for a wide range of insects. And when we encourage that diversity, then we get not only a diversity of our herbivorous insects, but also a diversity of our natural enemies. And that's gonna help bring balance to our system, a more sustainable landscape. Now, if you wanna learn more after today's talk about BMSB, about my community science project, about supporting natural enemies within our own landscapes and systems. I have a couple of links listed here. And so you can access um, this PowerPoint likely on your website as Renu was saying after this, and you can check out these other resources. Um, from working with these amazing master gardeners, um, I have found that I really enjoy this type of work and I was lucky enough to get a position as agent associate of home horticulture in the master gardener programs for Howard County. So I'll be starting in that position at the end of this month and I'm really excited 
um, to get started to continue working with master gardeners. I would like to thank my funding sources for my research, the members of the Shrewsbury Lab, the Maryland Master Gardener County coordinators that I was able to work with and communicate with in order to recruit my amazing um, community scientists. I especially want to thank my 50 Maryland Master Gardener volunteers. I wouldn't have been able to do this research, this project without them and to find these awesome results. And I especially want to thank those 17 Montgomery County Master Gardeners that were community scientists within this project. I want to thank you all for joining me here this morning for listening to my talk. I have this awesome photo here zoomed in. It's one of my favorite where it is showing a parasitic wasp emerging out of a leaf footed bug um, egg. They typically are these cool barrel shaped eggs. Um, and with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Madeline. This is uh, Dick Evans and uh, I've been writing down the questions people have been putting in. First, um, that uh, one person was doing a, a plant clinic and was asked if it's okay to eat food damaged by stink bugs. Is it okay? Yes, yeah, that is a great question. Um, it is totally okay to eat food damaged by stink bugs. They're mainly just causing that bruising as if you were to hit um, whatever produce against the table. Um, they're not vectoring any sort of diseases that you should be worried about within your plant. It's mainly an aesthetic damage. And so that's what a lot of our um, agronomic producers um, had to deal with is just it wasn't marketable since the produce didn't look any good. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I, I know the tomatoes that have been uh, modeled by these things are not very pretty. Uh, yeah, they're not good to look at, but <laughs> yeah. Are any of the wasps, uh, the parasitic wasps, apt to sting people if people walk into them? They will not sting humans, especially these really tiny ones. They have a very minimal amount of energy and they're really focused on finding their host so that they can reproduce. Um, and so a lot of the time they're gonna go completely unnoticed. The only reason I've come across these is because of my research and I'm actively collecting and searching for them, but you don't have to worry about them stinging you. Again, they're super tiny. Their ovipositor is only sharp enough to go through their host and that's what their main goal is. Okay, yeah, the person was asking partially because um, th there's been a rash of stinging insects in the her neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, not yellow jackets, and um, that have just been stinging people when they're just walking down the sidewalk. And uh, they're trying to, they want to, they're hoping they can find a name for the bug, the one bug that might be stinging. Um, because when she, if she can do that and explain it to people, they calm down and quit squirting insecticide everywhere. Right, um, right. Okay. Yeah, my guess would be there might be some type of sweat bee. Um, it could also be some sort of midge, which is a biting fly. So there are lots of different insects out there that can bite or cause little stings, which can be really irritating, especially in the summertime. Um, they're not gonna be these parasitic wasps, but they are likely maybe some other type of wasp or some other type of fly. Um, yeah. If there's a photo of one, I'd be happy to take a look at it for whoever has a question about identification. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, another, the last question actually. Uh, the squash bugs are also a member of the, well, of this group of, of BMSBs or are they? Squash bugs are actually a different group or family of insects. Um, they do produce eggs that are pretty um, copious within our vegetable gardens, um, but these parasitic wasps will actually attack um, squash bug eggs, um, the generalist parasitic wasps. So since we, from the results, as we saw that a lot of our top um, associated plants for some of these wasps was like turnip and kale, that's because we were finding um, squash bug eggs. And what's really cool is that these parasitic wasps are helping to control those squash bugs as well. Okay, that's, that's good. Um, uh, the person comments that the, the eggs of the squash bugs are shiny, almost metallic in appearance. Yes. And mm -hmm. usually found on the underside of the leaf, often near the vein, um, sometimes on top of the leaf. And uh, they said they find them all summer, hand-picked and destroy them in any 
stage I find them and uh, spot the, the spark, blah, blah, blah. the squash bug pierces the vine, sucks out the liquid killing the plant. Uh, I just thought that would be useful information in your presentation, you know, in future yeah. editions. Yep, Thank you yep. very much. That's, I think that's all the questions that came up. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. I was excited to be able to talk to you about stink bugs and biological control. All right. Thank you, Dick. Hey, um, hey uh, I want to wrap things up here real, real quick, everyone. Um, I want to thank our speaker today, Maddie, for her presentation. And uh, I'll, we'll hopefully see more of Maddie here in the future when she uh, starts her new position, I think, at the end of this month. And that's great news. And I want to thank all the master gardeners here who helped uh, with the research, Maddie's research. I thought that was a great effort. Uh, we collaborated with uh, the university itself and tried to help our, our students at the University of Maryland. Um, I want to also thank our today's tech team, um, Dick Evans and Sue DeGraba. And so thanks, everybody. And Hope see you guys sometime soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.